In this video, we look back over my first year of imaging from back in 2018. In some ways, it was fairly discouraging. The clouds had been relentless, and my mount was not cooperating. The two combined to keep time under the sky very low, and as a result, image quality suffered. To compensate, I tried to grab every last detail I could from the images, and that just magnified the flaws, or tended to create hard artificial edges in the images. In the process of making these videos, I went back and tried to see if I could improve on any of the old results from 2018, and I couldn't really. The data just wasn't very good. The weather remained uncooperative in the first half of 2019, but the second half was much better, especially September and October. I got help from several people, both locally and online, to try to resolve my tracking issues. I worked on cable management and continued to learn about image processing. Like the M31 image that finished 2018, this was another large frame-filling object. I tried longer exposures unguided. This put me back in the exposing too long category, and I threw away a lot of frames, but it made my longest integration to date. I couldn't even see the nebula in a single sub, so I had to trust that plate solving had put me in the right spot. After integration, though, the nebula popped right out. I still have focus creep issues through the night, and because I was running without guiding, there is image shift through the night, but thankfully very careful polar alignment kept it to a minimum. This was tough to process, but overall I was happy with the amount of detail I was able to get. The biggest problem was the splotchy color that made things ugly. I cleaned up as much as I could, but there were still blue blobs. In desperation I tried SCNR and removed blue, and suddenly the image was a lot cleaner, though I had lost a lot of star color. Thanks to the help of Terry59 from the Cloudy Nights forum, I'm finally getting a good guiding calibration on the mount. The guiding performance is better, but still not what it ought to be. However, I'm getting a slightly higher percentage of good frames. Processing was tough. If I stretched too far, color blotchiness appeared in the background. I lost a lot of frames toward the end of the night because of focus creep. I resolved to get an electronic focuser. I sent my deck axis off to Los Mondi in March because it just wasn't behaving well. When it came back, it also had their new spring load modification, which was welcome, but unfortunately nothing really changed in the performance of the mount. Deck just wasn't very responsive, and RA had sudden excursions. I bought an ASI 1600 and a moonlight focuser, and an off-axis guider along with the filter wheel and LRGB filters. I also built a flat panel using an electroluminescent panel. All of these contributed directly to better image quality. However, I was still losing a lot of frames to elongated stars. It took three nights to get four and a half hours of data. The data was fairly easy to process, even though it was my first LRGB image. It's not a great image, but it was definite progress. I'd give this a C compared to the Ds to C minus I'd give most of the earlier images. The biggest processing issue was just trying to push the data too hard. I was still trying to extract every last detail. Even so, I was happy about the relative ease of processing compared to the earlier one-shot color images. It also turns out that a lot of the small point light things that look like stars are really galaxies. There are nearly 100 galaxies visible in this image from a lowly 80 millimeter refractor. It also turns out there are four visible quasars. M13 is a bit small for my focal length, but it holds a special place in my heart. It's the first deep sky object I saw visually. 
My goal for processing it was to try to reproduce that view through the eyepiece as much as I could. The integration is short, but it all went pretty smoothly. My guiding woes still continue, though. I'm still throwing away lots of subs, but otherwise things are going well. Flats are working, exposures are closer to optimal, focus is good. Except for the mount, I'm a pretty happy camper. I'm still not making any progress with the mount. Nothing I'm trying is working on taming the issues. I can get good calibrations now, but round stars are problematic, even at only 60 seconds. Despite the short integration time, I was surprised at how much detail this had. It was small for my field of view, but processing was fairly straightforward. I couldn't crop as much as I wanted because that exposed the limits of resolution in the image, so I left it cropped fairly wide and tried to emphasize the isolation of M51 in the sky. I was actually pretty happy with how this came out. The subject is a bit small for my field of view, but the detail is good given the image scale. The exposures are a little bit long for my sky, but the clipping isn't bad. After all the time invested in trying to tame the mount, I decided to throw in the towel. I was convinced the problems were in the mount now. The budget couldn't really stand a high-end mount after all the recent expense, but there was a June sale on the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro, and I decided to take a chance on it. And suddenly, I was able to get good guiding. I tested exposures up to 8 minutes long and was getting round stars. And the results showed up immediately in the image quality. I was using much more of the available sky time. I was still spending a fair amount of time in dither settling, but that was something I could tune. We also had a stretch of clear nights all together, and I was able to take advantage of them. My only concern was the star solder. It's a very bright star, and I knew it was going to cause problems on the ASI 1600. And it did, but not as bad as I feared. I was even able to mitigate it somewhat in processing. This was by far my longest integration so far, and the results made it clear that total integration time was important. This was my first and only complete image from the Almost Heaven Star Party. I had hoped to get three hours, but I spent the first two hours fighting with USB issues in the field. I eventually cobbled together something that worked and managed to get 1.3 hours before M16 got too low in the sky. I could have spent the entire time just staring up at the summer Milky Way. It was incredible. But back to imaging. I didn't really think I'd get anything usable. It was only an hour and 20 minutes of data. But that data was from a Bortle 2 sky. This image nearly processed itself. The only real changes from what I had done in the past was to forego luminance frames and just do RGB and I used masked stretch instead of histogram transformation in PixInsight. I was amazed at the difference a dark sky made. This was an image that was the equal of 10 hours at home, done in 80 minutes. This has the distinction of being the image that took the longest in real time to complete, plus it was a new record for total integration time. I started it at the end of July and continued through just past AHSP, though I didn't get any frames at the star party. Image acquisition basically straddled the star party. I wanted to get at least 12 hours. My goal was to get as much detail in the crescent as I could, and that was a challenge. There are so many stars in Cygnus that stretching becomes a problem. Mask stretch definitely helps and retains great color, but the stars need taming. I tried to reduce them using Adam Block's method, and that worked, but it was complicated to implement. I went through several processing attempts before the final version, which seemed the best compromise between detail and star bloat. Several people seemed amazed I even attempted this with broadband filters. It's probably a lot easier to capture in narrowband, but I didn't yet have a budget for narrowband filters thanks to the recent purchases. This was about half from AHSP and half from home. I experimented with different exposure lengths. I was beginning to suspect that 60 and 75 seconds were longer than I needed at gain 76. The biggest processing challenge was modelization. It's all nebula, and I couldn't find good spots to place points for DBE. Instead, I used ABE, and it seemed to help, but it may have stolen a small amount of nebulosity from the image. Other than that, processing was fairly straightforward. I was learning the joy of having enough data to work with. To me, the elephant trunk here looked more like E.T.'s finger, but that's probably more a consequence of my framing with the trunk reaching up and into the frame from the lower left corner. Your mileage may vary. This was another hybrid project. One night was at AHSP and the other three were at home. There wasn't much from AHSP because clouds came in early and what did come in was just red, but I'm sure it helped. I continued the experiment of using 20 second exposures 
and while it worked, it made for a lot of files to process. That processing, though, was fairly straightforward. This was 9.6 hours, and I was careful to make sure the moon was out of the sky when the subs were taken. I tried an experiment of doing the pre-processing in AstroPixel processor, and while it did a good job, it was quite slow compared to PixInsight. Other than the processing time, there's a lot to like about the program, though. I also gave Nina a try for acquisition. There's a lot to like about it also, although there are still some rough edges. On my older images with dense star fields, the stars become overwhelming, and when I tried to reduce them, the results were never good. My stars had this fuzzy sweater look that I didn't like. This was the first time I was able to process an image and prevent that from happening. In large part, having a deeper integration helped with that as there was less need to push the data hard from processing. For me, this was an image where I felt I had turned a corner in the processing. I felt like I had some real expectation of how a tool was going to behave in PixInsight when I chose to apply it. I also limited myself to a small number of tools, which gave me less opportunity to damage the data with in-app processing. September 2019 was my most productive month of imaging ever. We had a lot of clear nights and everything felt like it was coming together. I felt like I had redeemed myself from last year's Western Veil. I liked the results from the Veil, but wanted to limit the number of files generated to speed up pre-processing, so I switched to 60 seconds at gain 15. This worked pretty well. Processing was fairly straightforward. I've become a big fan of mask stretch, and not bothering with luminance frames simplified both acquisition and processing. The fall seemed to be all Cygnus all the time for me. The horizons in my yard prevent me from going too far south, and there is so much there that I could spend a year and barely scratch the surface. I decided to try my hand at drizzle integration. My experiments with it in the past did not work well, but I was told that you needed both lots of frames and frequent dithers, and now I had both of those, and it made a big difference. The drizzle integration had great detail and was a pleasure to work with. Now that I had well-sampled data thanks to drizzling, I could try deconvolution, and that was tedious to figure out, but did modestly tighten up the details. This was the first dense star field where I didn't reduce the stars. I tried, but preferred the unreduced version. I also used the new weighted batch preprocessing script in PixInsight. It's still not as convenient as AstroPixel Processor, but it's a lot faster, and it did a great job, and was a lot less error-prone than the manual processing I had been doing previously. Fighting with equipment takes all the joy out of astrophotography. I spent far too long trying to debug the mount because I didn't know enough to know whether it was the mount or me. It was my first German equatorial mount, and I was assuming that the problems were all at my end. It turns out they weren't. I definitely recommend the EQ6R as a beginner mount. It worked out of the box, and the EQ mod software is great. I can't recommend the Losmondi GM811, especially for beginners, unless you're comfortable with tinkering. And if you are, it seems like a pretty pricey option to have to do that. It's a purchase I definitely regret. I hope this look back at my 21 months of images helps. My first attempts were pretty bad. My first year is pretty bad. But with perseverance, it does get better. For 2020, I'm planning to start using narrowband filters. Assuming that all goes well, then eventually I'll add a longer focal length refractor. I've been amazed at what this little stellar view refractor can do, but more focal length will let me get to smaller targets and not be undersampled. I may try my hand at some two-panel mosaics for a couple of targets that are just too big for my relatively wide field. My biggest challenge has gone from getting round stars to getting clear nights. I also live in a house that has very poor horizons. I'd love to put up an observatory, but I'm not convinced that it's worthwhile here, though a local club member does remarkable work with horizons that are at least as bad as mine. So, who knows, maybe eventually. And the old Los Mandy mount had a happy ending, though it wasn't with me. I sold the mount to someone who was more mechanically savvy than I am, and he was able to bring it back to life, though he had to do quite a bit of work on it. I'm not sure why so many of us had so many problems with the GM811, but my situation wasn't unique, and while Los Mandy was helpful, they weren't able to solve the problem. Ultimately, I lost faith in both the company and the mount. If I hadn't been driven to succeed, that might have been an easy derailment. In many ways, it's been like living with Murphy's Law. If there was something that could fail, it found a way to happen, not just with the old mount, but in a lot of ways. Let's have some great adventures in 2020.